Hey, you're listening to a Bible Bro Down podcast, a member of the Trinity Commission. This is where brothers come together to sharpen one another so we can rightly divide the Word of God. I'm Matt. And this is Billy. And we're back. And once again, uh, we promised to... Well, actually, you know what? I, I can't say that we're, we're not going to have a theology episode up before this because I don't know when this is going to come out. But the uh, we have another guest, and he's one of our favorite guests that we've ever had, uh, Dr. Braxton Hunter. How you doing, bro? I am doing great and ready to bro down. I don't know if it's going to be a Bible bro down, but we'll bro down about something. Philosophical. Well, yeah, so we're going to talk about your uh, debate, discussion thing. I mean, it wasn't a formal debate, but it was still felt like it. Uh, with Dan Barker over on Unbelievable Radio, which was uh, pretty awesome. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I have to tell you, I was pretty nervous about this debate, but in another sense... It was kind of the realization of of a dream because um, this is the first time I've debated someone that I listened to when I first got into worldview discussions, like back in the early 2000s. Dan Barker was debating some of our heroes and people like that. And so um, to, to be debating Dan Barker would have been cool enough. But I've also since about that time known that unbelievable Christian radio is kind of like a gateway for apologists. And so I thought if I could ever be on unbelievable, I'd feel like I really made it. So to have Dan Barker and unbelievable at the same time was, was pretty cool for an apologetics geek like me. Yeah, it was an interesting, I mean, it's hard to have these discussions when it's an hour and it's, you know, but my, my biggest question, obviously I know that you, you're kind of a, internal perfectionist and you really pre- over prepare for something which is what you know makes you so good at what you do um how much did you prepare that. for this so yeah um uh, the the advice that i got from mike lycona who has been my constant debate coach since i've been doing debates was that you need to you want to have months to prepare if you can and um so for the matt dillahunty debate last year i had about um, eight months to prepare, and I was preparing for about three hours a day. But with this one, uh, I had <laughs> when he first wanted to set it up, it was on a Thursday, and he said, Dan's ready to go Monday if you wanted to do it Monday. And I was like, <laughs> um, I'll do that if that's the only way it'll work. I really would like to have a week at least to like read his book and make some notes and, and things like that. And he said, Yeah, no problem. So I had a week and a half to prepare. And uh, during which time I read the entirety of the Oxford Handbook of Free Will, which is over 600 pages. Wow. (laughs) I read Dan's book three times and uh, read Sam Harris's book, read a guy named Alfred Mele's book, uh, quite a few journal articles. Um, But, you know, the the good thing about it was the free will stuff is something that you guys and I, we've all been thinking about for years. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of prerequisite knowledge that I already had. So... But sure. A week and a half. Well, like Billy said, it, so uh, I was kind of keeping track of the time. And if you take out uh, Justin's comments, y'all had, I think, about 45 minutes to split. And so you had maybe 23 minutes to talk on a subject that's pretty massive. And how much did you have to kind of leave on the cutting room floor <laughs> that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, there were. So I feel like I was able to address almost everything that he said. Um, I, I was... I, I didn't realize this till this morning was the first time I listened back to it. I think I probably spoke more than he did, uh, partly because I jumped in and cut him off a couple of times to say something. And I don't think he did that to me once. I really expected him to be more aggressive um, than he's he was. Chill. Yeah, he's a nice guy. He seems like a very nice damn, guy. Yeah, but if you've ever seen him debate, he's much more aggressive when he debates and um, and 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 more uh, bold and and flat and you know just says whatever he thinks um so so i you know i was prepared for that but he didn't even cut me off once and he left a lot that he that he could have said but i you know there were things obviously that i wanted to talk about but but when you have a debate of any kind one thing i've learned in debates from the few that i've had is prepare to say you know be be prepared to have the most important things you want to say and make sure you say those and then if there's time or if there's an opportunity you can throw in some of those things that you'd like to say but they're not as important and so i think i got out the things that i really most wanted to say yeah i i agree i think i don't think there was anything that i'm like oh i that was a terrible answer that braxton had in there you know there's this big hanging chad um um, this free will debate I, i think you had good answers and i think you 
I think your interruptions were good because I think they they were um, they they brought out things on on both sides of the argument that were relative. So ultimately, this was about is free will an illusion, and it was really about I guess uh, a big portion of it was Dan Barker's book Free Will Explained How Science and Philosophy C- Converged to Create a Beautiful Illusion, which he wrote in 2018. Um, so broad, broadly speaking, you know, um, before we jump into like the specific questions, uh, uh, that, that of the discussion, uh, give us like the 20 foot to 20,000 foot view of how you think it went before we jump into those specific questions. I feel good about it. Um, the, I mean, I, I don't want to sound arrogant. I just feel like it really went well. I thought it was a, a handy discussion. I think it opened up some areas that, were a few things discussed that I think even people who are familiar with the free will debate might have learned some things because there were things that I learned in preparation. You know, um, I, I think uh, I answered all his all of his issues, all the things that he brought up. I don't think he brought up anything that I hadn't thought of. I think we have clear answers to all the things that were addressed. And um, but you know, at the same time, I don't I don't think I would like go home crying if I was Dan Barker. I think he did a respectable <laughs> job uh, presenting the compatibilist position, although he call it, he doesn't call it the compatibilist. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, you know, ultimately, I, I feel as good about this debate as I have any debate I've ever had. As you should. Uh, and, and like you said, I mean, everything that he said was consistent within his worldview, so I don't feel like he would feel like he lost or anything, but I think he did great. Uh, maybe that. the reason he wasn't so aggressive is because you guys kind of started with this whole story about little one, the chipmunk. Maybe that just like made him all warm and fuzzy and he was just <laughs> <very> nice. <laughs> that was it. Well, <laughs> what, what you guys didn't even hear is before the, uh, broadcast started, we were just kind of talking and checking cameras and mics and stuff. And, um, I told him, I said, I told him what I said here. I said, listen, I said, this is pretty cool to me because I, I'm getting to debate Dan Barker, who I kind of came up listening to. And I said, so that's, that's pretty cool. And I said, I want you to know that as a communicator and, um, a- as a debater, I have a lot of admiration for you and really appreciate you. And I said, and I think I said this on the recording, but this whole thing about the chipmunk and the illustrations that you used, they really endeared you to me in a way that I didn't expect. And, um, so I kind of came out of, I, 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 maybe if I did this, it was not, it was not like manipulation. It was tr- It was on, I was being honest, but I maybe buttered him up before we ever got started. Well, you were maybe a fan. Why, yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. So speaking of the, the squirrel or chipmunk, whatever it was, the story about that, he, so he had, developed a, you could call it like a relationship so to speak with some of the uh, chipmunks in his backyard one of them in particular would come up and take food out of his hand eventually so he kind of almost tamed it or he 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 got it to where it would come up and and, and the thing that that stuck out to me was he described this chipmunk as as this relationship was developing uh it, it seemed to struggle with the decision on whether or not to come up and take the almond from his hand uh, versus retreating and and staying away from what could be a predator, and I so he compared that kind of to human will. Like the, the this animal has a basic instinct to a collect food, but b to survive, and it's choosing whether or not it should approach him. And he seems to want to extrapolate that out to humans. So he he used this chipmunk kind of as a, an analogy for possibly humans having uh, been hardwired for certain things and. And ultimately, when we get together in society, this idea of free will emerges as an emergent property from society. I don't know. I, I, I never heard anybody explain freedom like that and looking back at something, quote unquote, less evolved, like a, a smaller animal. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you make of that in terms of, is it so- comparable? You know, I, as I kind of got into a little bit on the in, in the discussion, um, but I'll say it more flatly here, he uses a lot of illustrations, and that is the most charming one that he uses. But the reality is these illustrations don't really uh, communicate well whatever I think he's thinking, uh, at least not to me. Um, I, uh, because even those people who take his position, basically, which is he calls himself an awe compatibilist, and I might as well go ahead and say, because I'm going to call him a compatibilist throughout this, and I might as well go ahead and explain what he means by that. Uh, so in the book, he basically wants to show that, so uh, compatibilists about freedom, as you guys know, believe that 
freedom is compatible with determinism, but in such a way that we redefine freedom, or at the very least, we don't use the typical understanding of freedom. What we mean instead is you do whatever you want, but you can't control your want. So it's all determined, but yet we can still talk about freedom and hold you uh, accountable and morally responsible, just so long as we understand that whatever you did, you couldn't have done otherwise. So they're determinists, but they use the language of freedom. Well, that's what Dan's doing. But Dan wants to say, he doesn't like the term compatibilist because he thinks that that, rec that legitimizes the debate. He doesn't think there should be de a debate. He thinks that uh, he's, he believes determinism is true at a scientific level, but then at the level of how we treat people, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a societal convention. Like um, like marriage or something like it wouldn't be able you wouldn't say something like determinism or science versus marriage. Uh, those are two different realms of strata, right? That, that science is talking about uh, you know the nature of the universe or whatever, and marriage is uh, perhaps a convention. We would say it's more than that, but a convention that society comes up with. That's how he thinks about free will. But what that cashes out to is he's a compatibilist, um, and and so even other compatibilists don't say that we're like animals. What they say is we have, even if you don't believe in God or the soul or libertarian freedom, they, we have what's called hierarchical thinking. The chipmunk is probably not, he probably can't think about his reasoning process. He thinks, but he's not thinking about his thoughts. You know, you and I, we can think about our thoughts and we can think about ourselves thinking about our thoughts. And I can think about you thinking about Billy's thoughts about himself. Mm -hmm. And we have that higher structure of thinking. And so I just don't see anywhere where the, where the thing about the chipmunk really parallels, except in a very rudimentary way of saying the chipmunk isn't conscious in exactly the same way we are, perhaps. He's just kind of running on determinism, and we know that, and it's fine. And you can still have kind of these fun little relationships, um, even if that's true. But, I, you know, I don't know. I, you have to have Dan on the Bible Bro down and ask him. Yeah, it's interesting. I remember I've been recently listening to a lot of Eric Hernandez talk about, you know, consciousness and, uh, and, and physicalism. And one of the analogies he talks about is like a dog, how, you know, it may have – a soul in one sense um, where there's like some decision making going on but when you give a dog food it's going to eat the food but it doesn't think about nutrition you know it doesn't you know pause and think okay how is this going to affect my body and my waist size and how other people look at me and things like that so it, it's like like i said it, it's very rudimentary in his analogy you could think well i can make a, a computer program where it says you know if then and give two choices and, and put in a delay there and it says look it's like it's ha it's like it has free will it's, it's thinking see the little cursor blinking and then it makes a decision it's like free will um yeah. but that's that's not really what we're we're describing here right yeah, uh, but but I think uh, uh, there's not an analogy that he gives in the book. I don't think that I don't see major problems with, including the chipmunk. In relation to this, I, I'm going to yeah. cut you off, Matt. Um, so he tries to, this this to correspond this illusion to like depth perception, and he says, you mm -hmm. know, all of this is just a survival trick of the brain. It's a useful and moral tool for our humanity. It's good to act like it's real. You know, the legal system has to assume the criminal could have done otherwise for social reasons, and it just seems, and you brought this up at the end because I think it was kind of like the crux of the matter. I mean, you've heard this same kind of um, accusation against, you know, theologians. Like, well, you know, you're just creating this construct of, of God and afterlife and, and, you know, this greater and, and, and benevolent being and all things working out for good and all that stuff because, you know, it makes you feel good. It seems like that's what he's doing with, with this idea of, of free will. Yeah, and he admitted, I, I'll tell you, I was actually impressed with how much he conceded in this discussion. He conceded yep. that we're just pretending. He says, so what if it's just a pretense? So what? It, it, you know, it's, I guess he means it's helpful and we kind of have to do it. But he's trading on the language and the ideas that are most at home with libertarian freedom to, uh, to do that. He also conceded, another thing, this isn't directly related to what you just said, but another thing that he conceded in this discussion is that the neuroscience experiments that are supposed to show that we don't have free will all have problems with them. So I was actually impressed with how much he conceded, but yes, that was one of the big takeaways that I thought about this weekend and wanted to include in the discussion was what you pointed out, Billy, which is to say, um, it sounds to me, Dan, like what you're saying is it's not real, but we need to pretend that it's real because it makes us feel good and is pragmatically good for society. 
And in fact, in the book, he says it outright, like we have to live as if uh, this is meaningful and as if we're morally responsible and as if all these things, and they're not, it's not real. And in, and in one part of the book, he actually says, oh, is free will real? Yes, but no, really, but not really. And it's like, this is where I resonate with Sam Harris. It's like, if you're going to go that route and you believe in determinism, then just go full bore determinism and be consistent. You can be consistent as a determinist or you can be consistent as a libertarian, but the compatibilist or the awe compatibilist or whatever you want, or the, we could, we could say the, the, um, I don't know, the new version of compatibilism that he's, that he this is the same old thing. Um, the, the reality is you're being inconsistent. You're wanting to treat people as though they have libertarian freedom when you know they don't, when you claim they don't. Yeah, it, it strikes me every time I heard him talk about it. And, and he even said, uh, it's a beautiful, useful illusion. It, really strikes me as ignorance is bliss like okay we may we may understand that it works differently and everything's dominoes but j we're just gonna pretend and a uh it, that seems a little especially at the end when when you're talking about meaning and the fact that in a cosmological sense he said this uh things what we do now doesn't have any kind of meaning but immediately it does it feels very nihilistic right like just eh, it doesn't matter and then um no well, I'll, I'll let you comment on that because i Lost friends. Well, yeah, I, I just think uh, one one of the things that you know the the inconsistencies and the and the, there's one point in the book where he's talking about a conversation he had with Jerry Coyne and um, Jerry or Jeffrey, I never can remember, but but he they actually he puts this in the book and he mentioned it briefly on the show, but what this guy was saying to him was, look, man, it you just need to go with it. And what we need to do is we need to start teaching people and training people that determinism is real and make that a part of our societal education and things like that, which I think would be horrific because we have studies that show that when you uh, predispose people to determinism, like ha like there's been experiments done. Uh, I mentioned it, the Vol and Schooler experiment that was done in, I think it was like 2010 or 2014 or something like that. And it, um, and it, it, it showed that if you have people like read an essay that implies strongly that they're determined uh, versus them being predisposed to libertarian freedom, a message of that sort, is that the people that have been predisposed to determinism are more likely to cheat like by a large percentage on a test than, than those that aren't. Which means that if you come to believe that determinism is true, you're more likely to act immorally. So I think it'd be horrific to teach a society that already has school shootings and everything else. Hey, you know, uh, it's all determined. You can't help it and all that, those sorts of things. But what Dan says instead is he's like, he says to this guy, yeah, but, but what's really more, what, what's the really the more reasonable thing we could do? Let's not do that. Let's instead... Uh, just change how we handle the justice system so that we don't do retributive punishments and things like that. But basically, I want everyone to recognize, and I didn't get to make this, is that what Dan Barker is doing is Dan is, uh, is saying we're not going to teach the truth. Now, he's not saying we're going to keep it from anybody, but we're not going to teach the truth. Let's let people keep on believing this illusion has some real you know, some reality to it. We're, we're just going to let them keep believing that because that's what's good for society and uh, rather than tell them the, the dirty, nasty truth. Whereas we would expect atheists of all people to be like, no, no matter how dark and difficult the truth is, we're, it's all about truth. We're going to teach the truth. I don't think that's exactly what's going on here. And, and his justification for that is it is better for society, right? It, society's overall health needs this. Yeah. Yeah, and in fact, he says somewhere in there in the in the debate, he says, um, "Look, of course we're going to hold this individual accountable. Of course we're we're gonna, they're the one that took the action. So of course, you know." And he even goes to the to the and I didn't get this is a cutting room floor type thing. He talked about the uh, if you have a guy with a brain tumor that's caught that caused him to have different thinking, such that he murdered a family or whatever, versus a guy who doesn't have a brain tumor and murders a family. Obviously, we're going to hold the guy who didn't have the brain tumor more responsible than the guy with the brain tumor. But for you guys and for me, we can look at that and say, yeah, but, but the guy with the brain tumor was determined to do what he did. And the guy without the brain tumor was determined to do what he did. In either case, they were only doing what they, did, they right. were determined to do. Right? <clears throat> right. You're using mm -hmm. libertarian ideas to try and hold up this bizarre denial of determinism, uh, but that you have to accept. It, it makes me think of the matrix and like, yeah, I'm, I know I'm going to take the other pill and just realize this is all I have. This is the best thing. The best option. She might as well deal with it. 
you mentioned um, you brought in some some uh, statistics, and mm. uh, you know you kind of mentioned some scientists and their beliefs on on free will. Um, over half believed in some form of determinism, while less than fifteen percent believed in free will. Um, and I know there's other studies when you start looking at philosophers and things like that. So I mean, should These we? These are the no, that that's actually the philosophers. That's, yes, yes. Uh, oh, okay. Um, yeah. You know, should we be concerned about about you know scientists and naturalists? Um, thinking that free will doesn't exist. I'm concerned about anybody thinking free will doesn't exist. There's a book that I quoted in there um, uh, called Free, uh, Why Science Hasn't Disproven Free Will by Alfred Mele. Mm -hmm. And um, he and he's not, he, he's, I don't know if he's a Christian or if he's a theist or, or, or what. And, uh, but he does say at the beginning, he's like, I am gonna. I'm gonna go ahead and admit to you that I have a dog in this fight. I'm biased in the sense that I think it's bad for people when they believe in determinism because of reasons I just described. That it can lead to demonstrably to people acting less ethically, and we would say morally. And so I think it's bad for anybody to believe in determinism. And then there's the softer thing that I just think it's bad for anybody to believe things that I think are false. Right. right. So, um. So so yeah, I think I think there's something to that. But I, but here's the good thing. Um, and I, I don't know how much you guys buy this, but, um, but as this, the world of, so you've got the world of philosophy and psychology over here, but as the world of science is, has, is coming to a consensus that there is some form of indeterminacy in the universe, or at least it seems as though there is, uh, that, that is, that is actually lending a great deal of support to some more research going into libertarian freedom. So I, I actually think we could see a turning of the tide. I, I don't think we'll ever see a complete turn, but in the coming years, I, I think that's good news, actually. So speaking of uh, how we're studying this, uh, things like free will, thought, consciousness, these are all uh, first-person experiences, and I believe uh, properly basic, right? Science, on the other hand, and Dan even said this, is an observation. and something third-person, outside looking in, trying to um so i mean can, can th this almost feels like it's outside of what science is capable of doing d looking at consciousness and free will more well, it the depends on it depends on what it is so from our perspective as christian theists i think that's probably true and this actually gives me an opportunity to clarify something i did in the debate um so you may recall there was a moment where uh justin asked me if there is no God and there's no supernatural, are you convinced then that there's no way we can have libertarian freedom? And even as recently as six months ago, I would have said yes. But as I've studied this thing more, I still think it's really, really, really unlikely that we have libertarian freedom if there's not a God and if there's not souls and, and these kind of things. But... Um, I, th I think that from what I've been reading about, uh, what, from the journal articles and the stuff I've been reading, I think that this quantum indeterminacy, if, if it can be amplified up to the level of our experience mm -hmm. or our brain function, I think that there's a possibility here. But the chances of it happening the way it needs to, when it needs to, every time, is so ridiculously weird and unlikely but I think it would be like the best teleological argument for God's existence that we've ever had. And with consciousness, um, I really don't believe, and Roger Penrose has said things related to this. He does think that something to do with microtubules and all kinds of things I don't understand in the brain that you can somehow maybe, maybe there's an answer there that gets you to consciousness. I just don't think there's a way to do it, just principally. I don't think that, I think that there has to be something like an immaterial self or a soul. Um, in order for this to work, I, 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 consciousness. Um, now, once you have consciousness, is there a naturalistic way that you could have free will? Maybe, but then that just goes back to what I just said. I think that would be a good argument for God's existence. But at that point, you don't really need it because you've got a soul anyway. So um, that could maybe do that work. My point in bringing up the quantum mechanics stuff in the discussion was I've, I knew that Dan was going to, or I suspected that Dan was going to want to turn it into a debate about the soul. And um, I, I didn't want it to go that way. So I thought I'd take that away from him before it started by just saying, no, no, I'm bringing you a naturalistic explanation. But the reason for that is I actually have been bothered. Now, this gets into what's called the intelligibility problem. And the intelligibility problem uh, is one that we hear from Calvinists and, and atheists who are determinists quite a bit. And that is, look, 
free will is impossible, uh, libertarian free will, because if determinism is true, you don't have free will. But the alternative is randomness, and you don't have free will with that either. And if you say, well, no, it's just self-determined, well, that's problematic too, because then how is it? Why did you choose one thing over another? Um, and if there are reasons, they seem to be causal. Now, I know that we have a host of answers that we give, but this is an actual serious problem that's discussed in the literature. Um, and so that had bothered me for a long time. I've been very open that that's bothered me for a long time. Um, and so what, so what uh, the quantum indeterminacy offers is people like Robert Kane, who have put work into an argument on this, they've come up with a way that it could work. You know, this is, this is just hypothetical, but here's a way it could work. So my point was, if that's even remotely possible on naturalism, then number one, it serves as a defeater to the claim because I'm not committing myself to it, but it serves as a defeater to the claim that you can't have libertarian free will. But secondly, here's my personal thinking that I didn't say in the debate. If that's even remotely possible that we have an explanation on naturalism, well, then for sure with the soul, the soul may have been designed just for that, you know, partly for that purpose that it could introduce indeterminacy at exactly the right time every time so that we have this libertarian freedom and we actually might have a mechanistic understanding of how that works that we have libertarian freedom. So it was kind of a debate strategy to bring up the quantum mechanics, but it was also there to show that you can't say that it's completely off the table because even some scientists and philosophers are still working on it. And if they found a way that it might work, well, it might work with the soul too that same way. I noted um, it was actually like 40 so plus minutes into the debate Seven. that you had not actually discussed anything supernatural at all. And, and I was like, I wonder what the reason behind that was. And thanks for providing that explanation. <clears throat> well, you know, I, you know, I prefer to have discussions about Christianity or the God of Christianity or resurrection or something like that. But I was asked to have this discussion on free will uh, Justin Brierley, the host, had a debate with Stephen Woodford, the YouTube atheist, uh, and he used a free will argument. And so he's, re he's really interested in that. And Dan had had this book on free will, and it just all worked out. Well, so Dan's book, the content of Dan's book kind of dictated what we talked about. And I do kind of regret that I didn't more intentionally say something evangelistic or about Jesus or whatever. But of course, as you guys know, if free will is on the table as a real thing if, if free will is defended libertarian freedom that is very consistent with christianity so it takes kind of uh, a criticism away i mean of course it could be that that God, that it is deterministic and we're just we just all need to be calvinist and mm -hmm. none of us believe that but but i mean that wouldn't mean that christianity is false if determinism is true but um still free will is important to us and i think it's worth defending anyway so during the debate he made a comment that honestly confused me and I think you, you addressed it later on, but he said something along the lines of free will does not require consciousness. Was that a slip of the tongue or was that, was he trying to make a point that's in his book that I just wasn't following? What was going on there? Uh, the simplest answer is, I don't know. And I don't want to speak for him. So I've made that caveat, but <laughs> I think, I think, what I, so, so the Libet experiments, I don't know if you're familiar with the Libet experiments. We you probably are. But Pretty for the much. listener, the Libet experiments were um, some very controversial and widely published experiments that um, that that basically showed or were intended to show that your choices are made um, about a half a second before you become consciously aware of the choices that you're making. So one of the ways that there's a there's a YouTube red show. It's a premium YouTube show called Mind Field. I don't know if you've ever seen Mind Field. And they do experiments and stuff like that. And they showed a, a modern version of a Libet experiment where you're supposed to pick between two buttons. And that this, these people have these, um, these you know, uh, this brain helmet scanners. on or whatever. Yeah, but yeah they're, supposed to, they're supposed to measure the brain states. And those things will, will know when a particular part of your brain lights up, basically, and which of the two buttons you're going to push. So they tell you um, to, to go ahead and randomly, whenever you want to, go push one of the buttons, whichever you want. And it's funny because as the person goes to push, the light above that button rather than the other one comes on before they ignite the button. And it's because they measured the brain state and, igni and, and the machine measured the brain state and ignited that light before the person was able to push it and presumably was before they were consciously aware of which button they were going to push. 
And so it's when you first see it, it's like, wow, that is powerful evidence that we don't have free will. Now, there are major problems with that. One of the problems is there's a difference between picking and choosing. Um, you know, when you're walking up to a gas station and there's two double doors there, you may not really deliberate over which door to go through. You just grab the first one and you just go. Or um, whenever you uh, scratch an itch, you might not be consciously thinking about that. There are choices that we make that, that's more like picking. It's just an impulse. And we probably aren't exercising a lot of free will. We're just going through life. You know, that's, that's all we're really doing. But when you actually choose, you're thinking about where do I want to go for lunch? What do I want to have for breakfast? Who am I going to marry? What school am I going to go to? There's more. That's a. That's more of an. That's more of a choice. You know, you're really deliberating over that. Well, if the libid experiments were right, all they would show is that. I mean, listen. The people were instructed: don't think about it. Just randomly do it. In other words. Try to be as unconscious about this as you can. Mm. Oh, well, big surprise. The the brain scan showed that that's what was going on because it was set up that way. Mm -hmm. There are other problems with them because like one thing that Libet himself noted was that there is a refraction time or there's a period between uh, your, your, motion, your motion to push one of the buttons, let's say, and your ability to veto that action. So the brain scan could tell you to do it and then you can stop it which means that you may not have free will but you have free won't which in turn means you have free will so there are lots of problems with these things but uh, all that all that to be said if these choices if our, if if dan is taking those things to be legit and he's saying it seems like our choices are made unconsciously well then all of our choices are made unconsciously which is a huge leap from what the experiment shows. But the point is that's probably where he's coming from. And so you wouldn't need to be consciously aware to have a compatibilistic form of free will. Um, I think that's what he's saying there. To bring in mm -hmm. some Bible in here, because that's, you know, Bible brought down. Um, we've, we did, I remember the video series that you did on that experiment. And then we did a follow up to that about the free won't. Um, and I think it's very interesting. And I agree with you that there's a lot of, natural you know actions that we take where you know we're just following in essence the nature of our biology you know when our body tells us to eat we go eat when it tells us to sleep we sleep these natural functions but um you know we have the choice to overwrite you know to override that that naturalistic tendency and, and what's funny is you see that you know kind of scattered throughout the scripture about walk by the spirit not by your flesh you know don't carry out to the desires of your flesh but walk by the spirit or you know before the boy you know will do this before he can refuse evil and choose good so he's refusing this naturalistic tendency to do evil and instead choosing good so you see that scattered throughout the scripture which tends to go right along with this this libet or lebe experiment um and it's interesting too because science is tend to focus on the first half of the experiment and disregard the second half where you can't override, you know, this, mm -hmm. this tendency to push the button. I, th I think you're absolutely right. I, I, I remember when you did that and I agree, um, we, our natural tendency might be to sin, but we can veto that action. Mm -hmm. And scripture says that now, um, I think that's true, but I also don't know how much stock I put in limited experiments at all. So if they're true, in that sense, they back up what what the Bible says, in, in, and there's some kind of obvious, tangible evidence of that. At the same time, one thing I didn't say about lewd experiments is what it seems to be is that your brain lights up. But it's not that that's when the choice is made. The choice is still maybe made consciously, even if it's just picking. But what that what that shows that what the brain scan shows is what's called readiness potential. And that's what it's called in the literature, that your brain is kind of mm -hmm. keyed up to make a choice. And, you know, um, if you if, if you if you're if I start talking to you, Billy, and I'm about to ask you a question, you're analyzing what I'm saying to try and in some way anticipate what I'm going to ask you so that you can give a swift answer when I get done talking. And you're probably experiencing in your brain states a readiness potential to answer. You're more kind of on the edge of your seat as you were when you're just listening to Matt drone on about ancient aliens or something. And so I think that's a I think I think that's an important thing. It could be that we're just measuring readiness potential. Yeah, how, how interesting would it be if they they redid that experiment? But I don't know if y'all are familiar with the trolley car problem. Uh, moral question of so you, you're standing above oh, yeah. uh, two tracks and a trolley car is running out of control and it's going to run into five guys working on the tracks in one direction, but you have this button in front of you and you could push it and change it to run over just the one guy in another direction. Now, it, so is it is it morally acceptable to 
uh, inter- in- intervene and and have it change direction and kill the one guy, or should you let it stay on its course that's going to kill five? And um, you know, you can justify either answer however you want, but putting that in front of someone and saying, okay, here, this is the question, A or B, and having them think through it. I'd love to see what the brain states are. I mean, obviously a readiness potential there, but Right, because that would be an example of rather than picking, choosing where you really have a chaos in your mm-hmm. brain where you're you you don't know exactly what to do. Um, I, I think that I, I, that that also is on an episode of Minefield. So this is all a commercial for the <laughs> YouTube premium show Minefield. They actually did that with people and made them think they were making that choice. Um, but uh, I don't know. I think it could be that the most moral for a Christian, the most moral thing to do there is just let it happen. I, I don't. I would hate to be put in that spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I'd probably go utilitarian. I yeah, five Kill versus one. one. I, yeah. I mean, I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> what else could that either do? way? Um, something's <laughs> happening. Yeah, but uh, so anyway, back to the debate. Um, well, actually, no, back to the Bible for a second, Billy. What you described and what what it sounds like we're describing is actually uh, 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 Ephesians two. The idea that the we have this nature in us that is. Uh, can be molded or changed. So we are we were by nature children of wrath. Why? Because we were practicing the patterns of the world. But now we're supposed to renew, be transformed by the renewing of our mind, i.e. change our practices, which will change our, our nature. And and we will and this also ties into the idea of imaging God. Um and this, you know, kind of a field of, of free will at this point, but I just want to connect some more dots on that. That was interesting. And we could throw a plug in for inspiring philosophy who's done I think three parts now on the mind. Mm -hmm. What's that? I I just said all kinds of good stuff. Yeah. (laughs) The mind, you know, changing the, the, the brain where you had the, the one mind in the beginning, you know, creating all of matter, et cetera. And and that's been a really good series too, just on, on could the, you know, cause there's this, there's these two sides and he's kind of taking that the mind is what is helping formulate the brain. Um, But some science and neuroscience and various other, pieces think that consciousness and or free will could be almost like an emergent property of of neurons and atoms and particles within your brain matter um what do you think what have you done research on on this idea braxton of, of science trying to think that you know consciousness and, emer- is an, and free will is like an emergent property it almost goes back to like he thinks that free will is an emergent property or an emer- emergent illusion of society yeah to be clear dan did use that language which was strange because he doesn't believe free will is emergent in the sense that it's like that real libertarian free will emerges from the material stuff he means more that as we have become evolved to the point that now we have this sort of higher level thinking we as a culture developed it or or recognized it or something like that it's a convention that's what he's saying but yes with consciousness so let's leave free will for just a second with consciousness in general um there is a uh there is an area called panpsychism and i think sam harris's wife actually wrote a book on panpsychism and it's the idea that okay look it's trying to solve what uh it's trying to solve the problem of um the hard problem of consciousness is what it's called where I mean, how how much sophisticated matter do you have to put together before you suddenly have a consciousness? It seems intuitively wrong, doesn't it? It seems like how many Lego bricks do you stack before you have a conscious Lego face? I mean, that it doesn't. It do, I mean, that's a really rudimentary way of putting it. But the idea is, matter isn't conscious. So how is just arranging matter in a really complicated way going to give you consciousness? And uh, this kind of uh, an intuition about this you can get from computers like we can have a really really sophisticated computer and people like richard dawkins think if you had a computer that was sophisticated enough it would be conscious but most of us look at it and we're like nah i, mean, it, I don't think so it, it'd be a really sophisticated toaster oven i mean that's all it is <laughs> um, and it would it would present as though it's conscious it would act as though it would claim to be conscious but it's just not that's not really what's going on so panpsychists come along and they're like okay well maybe all matter has this element of consciousness to it so that an electron has consciousness not in the sense that the electron is like thinking through things or aware of its existence but it has like this conscious aspect to it so that the more matter you put together in more complex ways the more conscious and aware it becomes 
And this, of course, allows for animals to be conscious and uh, insects might be conscious, but not, not in a way that really matters. And as you go on up, you get to us who are able to have thoughts about our thoughts about our thoughts and that that's how you explain it. And if you believe that, then I've got some oceanfront property in Oklahoma to sell you. I mean, that, that to me, that's just, that's just, we're trying to get around this. We don't know what to do. It seems that the answer can't be physical. So we've got to find a way to make it physical is how it feels to me. Well, to, to be clear, that that's never been observed. Like <laughs> That is completely an assumption on their part. It's not something right. that they've been able to measure or demonstrate in a lab. So yeah, I just... This, what you were saying kind of relates to what you talked about in the debate about the principle of uh, cred, 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 credulity. credulity. Yeah. Credulity, yeah. <laughs> first, first, what is that? Okay, so the principle of credulity, um, Richard Swinburne used it in his argument from religious experience for God, but I've adapted it here. And basically what you're saying is, the way I, the way I say it is, if you have an intuition that seems impossible to doubt, um, then you're justified in maintaining that um, belief until such a time as more as undercutting evidence comes along that that, sh that proves that it's not true. So let's say, for example, I, I don't know if this is a good example, but let's just say it. Um, maybe people were justified in believing that the earth was flat at one point because it seemed for them impossible to doubt. And so they were, they were justified in holding that and maintaining that belief until such a time as something came along that was an undercutting defeater to that. Like, uh, I mean, and this came way before space exploration, but let's just put it as starkly as we can. Until spa a, a space shuttle went up and took pictures of the Earth and sent it back down, and it, all these kind of things. Um, you know, th even though it seemed impossible to doubt, they were wrong. So the principle of credulity doesn't say, therefore, we're right. It says, I'm justified in maintaining this until you show me that I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and that's kind of, but you can't do it with just anything. You can't just do it with like, I'm going to claim that I'm the king of the world until somebody proves me wrong. I mean, it, the idea is that it is running off of an intuition that is deeply felt and that seems really impossible to doubt. The same could be done with morality. It seems like that is almost like, you know, um, the whole reasonable doubt, you know, kind of like our justice system beyond reasonable doubt. Um, and I think it's interesting, you know, you could point to examples like you did with like the flat earth, like it just seemed intuitively like everything looks flat. So, you know, why would I think otherwise until I'm shown, you know, in essence, beyond a reasonable doubt that it isn't. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, how, how important do you think that that intuition is as a defense? I mean, and you mentioned William Lane Craig and, and he, he personally, you know, says his personal experience, right, with God, you know, is, is an evidence or a witness for him. Um, how, how important do you think that natural intuition is? So, uh, and, and I, so to flesh that out a little bit, what I say, and I said it in the debate is, look, a good argument that's supposed to convince somebody of something is, um, is ba has premises that are plausible, which means more likely to be true than false. Right? At some bet level, we're always getting down to an intuition about something. And so you want, uh, you want premises that are more, or that are plausible. So the argument that is supposed to convince me that, say, morality, for example, is, well, here's a good way to do it. This is how I've done it in the past. Let's say that you, ha you have a deeply felt intuition that you exist, right? I mean, you, what, what kind of an argument would I have to present you, Billy, to, to convince you that you don't exist? I mean, that argument would have to have the strongest premises in the world. I mean, I can't even imagine it, right? Nobody can. Um, so... We're justified in saying you would be justified in saying, Billy. Though I, I, I have such a strong intuition that I do exist, that there is no argument that could possibly be presented to me that has premises that are plausible enough to convince me that that those they're more plausible than my immediate experience of existing. And this is what we could say about morality: my intuition that it's wrong to torture a children just a child just because you enjoy its screams. Um, that that's okay, that that's not objectively wrong. My intuition is that that is objectively wrong, and it's so strongly held that it's stronger than any possible argument you could present me to show me that it's not objectively wrong to do that. And so what we're doing is we're saying the same thing with, with free will. Now, how important is it? Well, you know, if, if we had had more time, let's say we had seven hours to discuss instead of an hour and 15 minutes on that thing, I would have gone into a much bigger case. This this intuition isn't the only reason I believe in libertarian freedom. I believe that there is a God who exists on the basis of strong arguments for that. 
Um, I believe that the first cause of the physical universe has to have libertarian free will because there's nothing outside of God to determine his actions. So uh, God has to have libertarian freedom. We did say that in the debate. Mm -hmm. So if I believe in God and I believe that God has libertarian freedom, well, then I believe libertarian freedom is a thing that exists. And God created us in his image. He created us to be uh, people that have relationships. So there are multiple ways that I go to get to libertarian freedom. But in this debate, I just point out, yeah, but another. but then there's two other ways you go, and those both came up in the debate too. One is we all know that we're able to make justifiable knowledge claims. Well, if libertarian freedom doesn't exist, justifiable knowledge claims don't exist. Justifiable knowledge claims do exist, therefore libertarian freedom exists. And you can do the same thing there with morality too that you do with that. So uh, I think there's ultimately v several ways to get there. But to answer your question directly, how important is that intuition? Apparently important enough that every society that has ever existed on this planet has thought that the strength of that intuition is so strong that we can actually hold people accountable, put them to death, lock them up on the basis of the strength of that intuition. So an observation and then a, a question for you. The observation being, it, it's it's crazy, the idea of the, the principle of credulity. Like, uh, in a minute, I'm going to go out after this call and pick out something for lunch. Don't know what it is, but I've got a whole kitchen worth of choices to make. And if for someone to convince me that I don't have choices, that this is somehow all determined, for them to demonstrate that, it just seems completely... I don't know. It way too hard. <laughs> it's, it's a too big of a task for them to try to convince me that I'm not going to go in there and make a choice. That was based on what you just said. Moving forward, you mentioned uh, God's knowledge, and uh, he did have what he calls an argument. He, I think he, the abbreviation was FANG. <laughs> it was uh, uh, basically, I forgot what the acronym stands for, but God... Free will if, argument for the non-existence of God. There you go. Mm. So it, this, this is something that I know you have heard a hundred times from uh, Open Theist, actually. Uh, and it is that if God foreknows his own free will choices, then he is not free to make a different choice than what he foreknows. And that's his. That's one of his apparently slam dunk arguments against God. How do you feel about that? So he did, I kind of complimented him in a way before I dealt with this by saying, um, I know that you're aware, Dan that it would be a category error to say about human beings that if God knows what we will freely do, then, then we're determined and can't do otherwise because we would, because knowledge isn't causal. And so we would say, um, God, God to say God foreknows in this sense is to say, God knows what we will freely do so that if we freely do something else, that's what he will have known, right? Mm -hmm. That that's how we handle that. But that's true even for God. You know, God knows what God will freely do. I think an open theist would say this most of the time with most of the things that God, or at least some of the things that God knows he will do. Because um, open theists believe that God knows certain things he will do in the future in response to creatures and, and with sinners and judgment and all those kind of things. So uh, those are still free choices because God knows what God will freely do. But for someone like me who believes in exhaustive omniscience, I, I believe uh, that God knows what he will do, but he knows what he will freely do. The only reason for someone in my position, so I think we could still say God has the, the principle of alternative possibilities that he could have done otherwise. It's just that that was all settled in his mind because he's an omniscient being. The only reason we change our minds about things is that we think through things and combine ideas in our head and learn things, and we end up doing something that we didn't think we were going to do. Um, but for an omniscient being, in the sense that I mean omniscience, he doesn't have to think through things like that. He just simply instantaneously knows all those things, including what he will freely choose to do. Um, so I, I think he still has the principle of alternative possibilities, but as I said on the show, let's say he doesn't. Let's just say he doesn't have that and there's only god can only ever do the maximally good thing or whatever um or he can't do things because he knows what he's going to do can't do something else well still as i just said a moment ago by definition if god's the creator of everything then there's nothing external to god that determined his actions so in the source sense even if he doesn't have the principle of alternative possibilities He's free in the sense that nothing external to the agent determined the actions of the agent. 
And that is what's both necessary and sufficient for libertarian freedom, is that nothing external to you determines your actions. We didn't get to go into this except to mention it uh, in passing, but there are these examples called Frankfurt examples that I think demonstrate that there are situations that we can conceive of where a person would only have one choice, but yet they were still free. Maybe that's something that would be fun to talk about. Do you want me to give an example of Very one? Very interesting. Yeah. So Okay, so, so let's imagine that um, the Democrats really, really, really don't want um, Donald Trump to win again. Let's imagine that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and uh, and let's and let's so let's imagine that Nancy Pelosi gets some famous uh, neuroscientist or whatever to secretly and let's say it all came down to a popular vote, which of course we know isn't how it works, but let's just say it did. And so this all hinged on one guy's vote, and his name's Frank. Okay, and so Nancy Pelosi arranges for this neuroscientist to put this chip in Frank's head, and he's not, and Frank isn't aware of this. And what's going to happen here is. When Frank goes into the voting booth, if he's freely going to vote for Biden, if, if he plans to vote for Biden, nobody's going to intervene and he'll vote freely just like he would have under any other circumstances, even without the chip. It's a free choice. But if he goes to vote for Trump, then the uh, chip is going to recognize that before he makes that decision and let the controller know and shock him into voting or manipulate his brain such that he has to vote for Biden, okay, and can't vote for Trump. So, unbeknownst to the agent, Frank, if he votes for Biden of his own free will, it will be a free choice. But if he goes to vote for Trump, he will be shocked and forced and manipulated to vote for Biden. So, there's only one thing that is a live possibility for Frank in this situation, and that's that he votes for Biden. But... If he really chooses to do it, it's still a free choice, even though there wasn't really another option available. And what this example is supposed to show, what all Frankfurt examples are supposed to show is we can conceive of situations where the person only has one choice, but they're still free to make when they make that choice some of the time. Are you sure Thoughts? that's not a one saved, always saved argument? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Although you could, you could, you, we could work on that. I mean, <laughs> it's not that they're not free to choose to leave God, but God's gonna their their brain, and they're not gonna want to yeah. leave God. They only have yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Frankfurt soteriology. Yeah, <laughs> Frankfurt. <Italy. laughs> oh man. Sorry. Uh, well, I think that's pretty interesting. Don't you? I mean, I think that's that that there's something to it. I mean, there's criticisms of Frankfurt examples, mm -hmm. but I think that's pretty good. And if it's successful, it would show that you don't have to have the principle of alternative possibilities all the time in order to have libertarian freedom. Yeah. I'll have to flesh that out. I'm going to have to think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Think about it. So towards the end, again, y'all get into it. There, there are some things that y'all hit on throughout it. And I, I just want to bring it up again. The idea that None of this, Dan, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but Dan basically said, ultimately, none of this matters. Uh, again, if just because it's meaningful, it's not meaningful. Like you, our conversation right now is not meaningful in like the, this quote unquote cosmic sense where it's, it's in a million years, who cares? It feels like there's some possible, and a shout out to uh, Chris Featherstone in the episode we're going to have with him, hopefully in the near future. But what, what, it seems like there's some probably, some real emotionally negative side effects of thinking in that direction that nothing I'm doing now means anything in ultimately. Like, I don't know. How, does he address that in his book? The, the idea that this could have a, a serious psychological impact? Um, not that I recall. And I read the book two and a half or three times, but, um, hmm. but he does talk about, so the biggest argument against compatibilism is the consequence argument of Peter Van Inwagen. And there are a variety of arguments that are all consequence arguments. And they're what we've been discussing basically this whole time, which is if this is true, you can't talk this way as a compatibilist because if the past history of the universe, uh, your past life experiences, your brain states are all determining what you do, then to talk about morality and moral responsibility to talk about rational knowledge claims and things like that is all is is all make believe it, mm -hmm. because we know how it's working. It's all being determined, and and so 
uh, that's the consequence argument. Well, he just seems to ignore all that and say, yeah, but the truth is we know that this agent is the one who took the action. So of course we can hold them praise. Do you really expect me when a new, when a, when a toddler takes their first steps for me not to go, Oh yay, you did it and praise that toddler. Yeah. We know that no one's really praiseworthy or blameworthy at the scientific level, but we have to act that way. So he thinks he's resolving the psychological problem that you're referencing by saying we can play pretend and, and keep the stuff that avoids that through compatibilism. And that's why toward the end, I was like, yeah, because because he kept saying, like, look, we know the truth. We, it's like with a sunrise. We know what's really going on, but we talk this way. No, no, no. You know it. Sam Harris knows it if it's true. Daniel Dennett knows it if it's true. But there's a lot of people in the average culture that don't suspect that determinism is the case until you tell them that. And you're let, you're saying, in effect, this is what I'm taking, you're saying, in effect, let them believe the lie because it'll be better for society. And I'm saying, don't let them believe the lie. Have the courage of your convictions. But don't do that either because that's horrific too. Accept yeah. the truth mm -hmm. because you're wrong. <laughs> <We're Yeah. retaining laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it just oh, seems man. like the repercussions of of the that view that free will doesn't exist or libertarian free will doesn't exist. You know, um, there's just a, a domino effect of like like the studies you mentioned, where if somebody thinks that everything's determined, they are likely to change. just all sorts of things. Um, you know, there's no moral responsibility, you know, no no rationality or, or reason or n knowledge. It just seems like it's a, a, a huge repercussion effect and and you understand i i mean if if i scientific like if i was a scientist and i believed that that was true you'd have to be pretend because society couldn't function in to me in my estimation without thinking that knowledge and persuasion and evidence and reason and rationality and and right and wrong and and all that stuff didn't exist and wasn't true and objective and we could hold 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 on to that it would just crumble i agree it, it, one thing that this this is tangentially related is i'm always impressed with the idea that a naturalist thinks that we went from chaos to higher and higher levels of order when entropy seems to tell us that you're going to go from order to higher and higher levels of chaos and even from a, a a conscious perspective in terms of, of thought and uh, even social development and these emergent things that, that he's talked about, uh, th they keep getting more and more complicated uh, over time. I mean, it just take science, for instance. If, if determinism is true, we're, we are somehow uh, determin deterministically able to progress this field further and further instead of it breaking down. Um, like you pointed out, the, the teleology of this just seems so obvious. Yeah, and like whenever I'm talking to someone, like perhaps another Christian who's experiencing doubt about heaven or about the resurrection, like that we'll be raised one day or, you know, some of these kind of things. And it just seems so far-fetched. It seems so unbelievable or whatever, which it doesn't to me. But if it does in a moment of doubt to someone, I, I, I tell them, like, look at your hand. Think about, look, this is made to grab things. Um, your mouth is made to speak and eat and breathe. I mean, even if you think evolution is true and we all got here by evolution, it, it's, it, it's, it's already a little too perfect. My conscious experience, uh, human sexuality, how everything works in life, it's too perfect. It's already that amazing. Is it that much more amazing to think that you could be raised from the dead or that there's, a, you know, that you could go to heaven? I mean, it, I think we... I was just telling my daughter the other day, I was saying, look at our dog. We've got this dog and, and, and he is a part of the family. And I, you can have a relationship with a dog. It's amazing. And uh, the dog is really upset when my wife isn't at home because he's very much her dog. And he'll come and he has a personality and he'll come and you know lick you and, and everything. And I, I told my daughter, I was like, we kind of already live in kind of a Narnia like world. <laughs> There's this little furry creature that lives with us and has a personality and, and all these kind of things. It's already an amazing world. There's, there's a, in the voyage of the Dawn Treader, the book, not in the movie, there is this uh, conversation between Prince Caspian, I think, and maybe Edmund. 
and uh, and he's and and somehow they they're saying that they're going to sail off the edge of the world, right? We're back to a flat Earth again, by the way, twice in this conversation. <laughs> and, and and Caspian Caspian saying we can't go any further that way because we'll go off the edge of the world. And um, Edmund's like, wait, what? You mean Narnia is flat like that? And he's and he's like, yeah. What did you think it was? And he said, well, the world that we come from is a ball and you can walk all the way around it and it hangs out there on nothing and all this sort of thing. And Prince Caspian is like, and this is so cool because it turns Narnia on its head. And uh, Caspian's like, wow, I've always wondered what it would be like to live in a world that was like a ball and that's so whimsical and it doesn't even make sense. And how does all that work? And it just makes me, it, it kind of turns the, turns it back on the listener and it's like, You've been looking at this story of this magical world with talking animals, and you've been thinking this is some fairy tale world, but look at the world you live in. The world you live in is like that and is whimsical and seems fairy tale like. And so the idea that we would ever say that something is just a little too outlandish or whatever, uh, that our God is a creative uh, artist, a whole lot more creative than C.S. Lewis. And I just remind myself and remind doubting Christians of that when they when they think about it. it's just all a little too perfect and the teleology is too specific. Cool, man. Uh, anything um, else, I, Billy? I, yeah, I mean, we talked about this before, but I think and in, in you brought it up during the debate and at the end because I think uh, and and it's worth re restating here again. Um, ultimately, it sounds like Dan Barker is concluding that yes, free will, um, morality, the justice system—it's not real, but we should act and behave like it is. Um, we're going to pretend that it's real because it makes us feel good and it's pra pragmatically good for society. society. Yeah. And it just, again, I, I, I think it's very interesting that that's his perspective or his view when, <laughs> again, turning it around to Christianity and theology and, and belief in the afterlife and belief that we have free will and, and just uh, and, and moral responsibility and moral accountability. And it just, it's so interesting to, to like see things to flip the, to where it's it's coming from you know the the atheist who's doing the same thing <laughs> yeah you know one could say billy one could and i thought about this but i i, I didn't want to say it until i'd thought more about it and even now i probably need to think more about it but one could say to dan barker then well then why do you have a problem with people believing in god i mean you're saying that it's okay to make believe in something that that it, you don't think is real if it makes you feel good and it's good for society, well, why shouldn't we believe in God? And if the answer is, well, because people use religion to make people, to, to persecute other people and all these kind of things, you could say all that about how the compatibilist is treating people who aren't really responsible as though they are responsible. Right. So you can really make something out of that. Yeah, the injustice of holding people accountable for things that they're determined to do and and it's just you could think of all the like the, the studies that show well if people think they're determined they're going to do more bad things and cheat and lie and just there's i mean there's negative repercussions on on pretending both views and like you said we need to pursue the truth and and focus on what the, the truth is and not live in a pretend world amen yeah, it, seem, it seems to to really belittle humanity to the point that we're just robots right and so but i think the response to the injustice uh, idea billy is that they would say well okay so uh, uh, fred down the road committed a murder he may he fine he was caused to do it by his his circumstances in life his mental whatever um but he still committed a murder and so we have to remove him from society for the benefit of society and we're going to put him in this institution where hopefully we can retrain him to be better and hopefully release him into in a state that is not a danger to society. They they would still justify it that way. And I, that's true. But I think, and I think I said this in the debate. I don't know if it had any impact. But if you back off a little bit from something that would put you in jail to just uh, psychological suffering, like the woman who cheats on her husband, mm -hmm. and now she thinks, and she's made to believe, and Dan Barker would let her believe that she could have done otherwise and that that was that was um that was her fault when in reality i mean if determinism is true she could benefit from the gospel of determinism and realize that she didn't she she couldn't help it and you can go the other way with people who were were going to hold responsible for things that they couldn't do and it's and it's not on the level of incarceration and again i think this is a subject that you could 
there are books written on it, right? How the 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 quote unquote handbook is six hundred pages on free will. Uh, th- this is great. not. You'd it love is, it. It is not a. It's not a small subject, and it does tie into the the hard problem of of consciousness and mind mind and body and it, it, having a, a forty five minute conversation just really scratches the surface mm-hmm. barely scratches the surface so um i don't know if for, for more resources on this obviously we would shout out trinity radio we do it all the time but for more resources on this outside of of what you produce over at trinity radio where would you point people to dig into the subject more so um i would definitely so there's two sides to this there's free will as uh an issue with naturalistic determinists like Dan Barker, but then there's also free will in the theological realm for people who are Calvinist versus non Calvinist. Mm -hmm. And so I think for the theological realm, I'd point you to some of the great works on this, um, you know, like Leighton flowers has, or Norman Geisler, or, you know, some, some of those sorts of guys, um, in the, in the realm of determinism, when you're dealing with, uh, naturalistic determinism, I think that that book that I mentioned that uh, shows how all the neuroscience findings are are not conclusive and don't show that we don't have libertarian free will. That's Alfred Maylay's "Free: Why Science Hasn't Disproven mm-hmm. uh, Free Will." Another one would be the Oxford Handbook. Now, the the Kindle for it is still like forty something bucks, but so it's but I mean it's worth every penny. There are individual articles in it that are worth all of that. Um, I think that uh, if you if you want to hear what atheists who are hard determinists have to say, Sam Harris's book on that is one that should be read. Um, but uh, you know, I, I yeah, I think if you get those books, you, you'll have a good start. And um, one things one of the things I love about the Oxford Handbook is it really does lay out the libertarian case too. Now, if you want to get to the soul and how the soul impacts that. Um, I would push you to someone like JP Moreland, uh, who's got some books related to that issue. So right on, right on. Um, I, I get one last shout out real quick to unbelievable radio. If, if you're listening to this and you've never heard of, I mean, uh, yeah, unbelievable radio, uh, Justin Brierley has been arranging these kind of conversations between very intelligent people for years. And, and then he had breakfast. Just don't, yeah. The, the, do I? <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if someone was going to say something. <laughs> uh, cool. I just had to throw something in there. It was <laughs> serious. I, I expect nothing less. <laughs> but get over there and, and uh, check it out. Uh, subscribe to the, the YouTube channel. It doesn't cost you anything to subscribe, and it does help uh, these guys, these Christian brothers and sisters who are making these this content. So Cool. Anything else you want to shout out, talk about? Um, yeah, um, um, the quick. other members of the Tr- Trinity Commission. Uh, so there's Trinity Radio. There's uh, Soteriology 101 with Leighton Flowers. There's Steve Gregg's The Narrow Path. And now um, Chris Date. Uh, and his is called, uh, what is it? Theology the Apologetics. What? What is it? The Apologetics. The Apologetics. And uh, there's another one that we've just added. Um, Sean Hurst. I think his is called believing thinkers or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and he's a Trinity student. So, yep, there we go. Awesome. Well, Braxton, thanks for, for taking the time to uh, come talk to us. We miss you over here on, on the bro down. So thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> and we need to get you back sometime in the next, you know, near future uh, to talk again about uh, near death experiences, out of body experiences. And I'm, w- after you've you've done your homework and listened to our interview with Chris Date, we we could talk about consciousness as well, and how that though some of those things seem to be evidence for consciousness, or how would that work with the naturalistic perspective, things like that. So, yeah, and and our our plug here, we, we really want um, Eric Hernandez and Braxton to debate um, Chris Date and Nick Quint on physicalism versus substance dualism. I think that would be fantastic. I think a really good discussion for you know all those interested parties. I've mm-hmm. actually talked to Chris, Chris and I have talked about doing a written debate and that would become yeah. a book on that subject. Mm-hmm. That'd be fun. <laughs> That's like the yeah. book of emails. <laughs> it would be long. I'm scared to debate. I'm scared to debate Chris Day. He's one <laughs> That's of the what best said too. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Well, uh, I think that's it, but thank you again, Braxton. And, uh, until next time, God bless. God bless.